someone do it? Good. Everyone, all right. Good weekends. Anyone been to the rodeo yet? I'm going tonight. I've never been. I've no. I have absolutely no idea what to expect. What's the best part? Is that where the little kids are on the sheep? Okay, so I need to ask an actual question though. I don't have a pair of boots. Would it be wrong to wear sneakers? Is that okay? Why well, look like a like a? Oh. I I yeah. <laughs> Teacher salary? No no no. But I mean, is it okay to wear sneakers and jeans? Is it like I'm not gonna look like a, like a fool? Because I actually I live by the medical center, so I'm gonna walk. It's about a two mile walk, which isn't that bad, but. I went to a football game once. It took me an hour and a half to get home. To travel two miles. I'm just going to walk it. Well, I can take, I can, I can walk 1.7 miles to light rail, and it's only just half a mile on the light rail. So the bulk of it, it doesn't buy me much. Uh, I, I, I tried. I couldn't take the light rail, but it won't. It will only get me about it's taking me half a mile walking. Yeah. So if I if I walk, it's I, I Google says it's a 40 minute walk. Uh, so I'll just do that. I'll probably be quicker than uh, otherwise. So what time supposed to get there though? What's what's a good time to get there? Yeah. No, I know, but so what's the right time to get there? I think the concert's like at seven thirty, but like, what time is this? Like like six? Like what time's early? <laughs> so I have to start walking after class, I guess. Uh, okay. Okay. That's what I figured. I'll go home and I'll probably just leave right from. I should get there around. I should get there around five if I leave right away when I get home. Is that a good good plan? Yeah. yeah I don't even I don't even know. One of, so there there are not many perks of being a professor. One of them is the school got access to a box. Oh. One of the people that's on the board of the school uh, has like a limited number of tickets and I was able to get one. So I'll let you know how it goes on uh Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a hard job. Cash? You don't accept credit? A lot of cash? Is that a thing? Yeah. What's that? Swifty, the swimming pig? Does a pig swim? Okay, I won't. All right, what else? Anything else you recommend? It only saves me half a mile to, to take the metro. Uh, maybe I'll take it on the, on the way there. How, how do you even pay for it? I don't even know. Is it? It's free. Is, no, I mean, <laughs> is, is, it, is it free? No, it's a dollar. Do you just pay it on the, when you get on? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I actually, I've been to a livestock show before. I don't know if I told you this, but my parents came to visit me in, a, in the fall. They're from New York. So I took them to the Fort Bend County Fair because we were going to the George Ranch. And I knew there would be a livestock show, so I took them there. And they had no idea what it was. And I was like, what is that? Come on, you'll see some animals. And he, I was like, it's like a petting zoo? No, no, not quite. And you know, they have the rough to rover after pig and chicken. And my dad sat in some uh, pig poop, and he was just he was just irate. He, he was like, why did you take me to this? I was like, well, I want you to experience it, because you'll never, ever see this in New York. You, you, this doesn't exist where I'm from. Uh, OK. So I thank you for the advice. All right, so now I'll leave as soon as I get home. That'll be a good plan. I'll get there as early as possible. OK. I won't ask if there are any questions from last time because I know there are. But today we're going to do a lot of review. In fact, all those questions at the end, we'll go through all of them one at a time. So hold your question until the end because I hopefully will be able to alleviate some of your concerns. And if not, then we'll we'll do it later. But this is probably the previous class, this class, and kind of the next class probably one of the toughest of the semester. Um, it's just the, it's the conceptually most difficult because it doesn't make sense. It's not intuitive. Um, one note, which you should have seen the syllabus. So the class for Thursday. Is rule against perpetuities won't be an exam. I'll say that again. It will not be an exam. I recommend you do the reading and you learn it because it will be in the bar. And if you ever do property law, you're going to need to know it. But I'm not going to test you on it. The reason why I'm not going to test you on it because it's really difficult. It's going to require you to study a lot and rack your brains. And I'd much rather you conserve that energy for more important things that are not quite as uh, uh, conceptually difficult. Like, say if rap takes you 20 hours to study, I'd rather you do like three topics that are six hours each in that same time. It's just it's, it's an annoying topic. So. We'll learn it. I'll teach it to you. We'll spend the entire class on it. Ask whatever questions, but we'll not be the exam. OK? All right, let's get, uh, let's get started. Um, OK. So where did I leave off? Who remembers? You're up? Oh, were you here on Tuesday? Yeah, well, all right, you're up first then. What was your question? <laughs> Not really, no. 
No, I mean, and, and those, remember there were the four things and the three of them were abolished. Ones that are abolished, don't worry about. Um, I don't even think, I'm not even going to talk about the, the Shelly case. I might mention in passing on Thursday. Um, I only put it on the readings for today, so the readings for next week weren't that long. I try to keep the, keep the readings less than 30 pages. And Thursday, we had a heavy read, so I just kind of tacked it on. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have read the Roland Shelley's case. So, you know, yes, ma'am. <laughs> what does an art to 645? So what time should I get there? Six. OK. No, but I want experience. I want to take all in. All right, I'll get there like 6, 6.30. OK, that'll be good. All right, thank you. All right, so let's do, um, all right, so Niles, let's do a little bit of, of review, OK? So we talk about future interests, right? We have to be precise. There are future interests in the transfer war, the person transferring the land, and then there are future interests in the transfer of the person receiving the land. So let's let's first talk about the future interests in the transfer war. Okay? So Niall, say my estate is fee simple, right? What would the future what would the future interest be in the transfer war? What would it be called? This is this is the easy one, the simple one. Yeah. So the grant is from O to A. Uh, from O to A, what would the future interest be? Good. That's that's right. When you're giving something in fee simple, there's no future interest because you're giving in fee simple. Okay. Slightly trick question. Okay. If there is a fee simple, the feasible. Okay. Or a determinable. Oh, got it. Determinable. I can't even remember. The fee simple, the feasible. Okay. Determinable. Um. Uh, Philip, what is the future interest that remains in the transfer war? Good, and what does that mean? Right, so this is saying, I will give this to you so long as it's used for a school. When it's no longer used as a school, it reverts back to the transfer war, okay? Um, uh, Zach, so if I give you a fee simple, Subject to condition subsequent, right? What is the future interest that remains in the transfer or? Good. And what does that what does that do? And what's the big difference between the possibility of the reverter and the right of entry? And what has to happen? What does the what does the grantor have to do? It's it, the, the answer is in the in the phrase you're telling me right of entry. What does the grantor have to actually do? Yes, he has to enter. It requires him to take proactive steps. With the possibility of the reverter, it snaps back. It's right away automatic. With the uh, right of entry, the grantor or the transfer has to take affirmative steps. Okay, so those are the the main futures in the transfer. We did those last week, and th those I think are are, you know, easy enough, I guess, by comparison. So then we learn these future interests in the transferee, okay? And we have this category called remainders. The remainder is the interest that the transferee gets, okay? What's one of the types of the remainders, uh, uh, Taylor? Good. So so what what makes a, rem a remainder vested? Given to an person. Per perfect. That's perfect. So if there's some interest in a future person, I'm sorry, if there's an interest in a person, that person's been ascertained, and there's no condition precedent, then it's vested, okay? There's also the, the vested remainder subject to open, uh, and that comes into play when, the, for, for example, there are children who might not yet be born yet. Scroll. Okay. Uh, uh, Jordan, what's the other type of a remainder that we talked about? Okay, good. Now, what's the contingent remainder? How is that different than vested? Okay, what else? Well, try and figure it out. The previous one dealt with people who were ascertained. Yeah, they're exact opposites. So even if you don't remember... Both of them, if you remember one of them, you can read the other one out. 
you can just you know unascertain, ascertain. Condition precedent, not condition precedent. They're just they're, they're they're mirror images of each other. Okay. So these are the future interests and the transferees. We have another future interest that doesn't really fit in here, which is the executor interest. Um, Brandon, why does the executor interest not really fit in with either category? Exactly. It's not the transfer war, and it's not the transferee. It's some third party who's in the in the case, and that's what we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about executory interests. Okay. Everyone with me so far? Good. All right. So, um, Jameson, what's what exactly does an executor interest do to someone who already has a piece of property? What does it effectively do to them? And the executory interest, um, the remainder goes to the third party once the condition. Good. So say you know it's from A to B, so long as some condition, and then to C, right? So say for a lot of years B has it, and then the condition satisfied. What does C do? What, what does C's interest do? C, they execute. And what does that mean? They, um, well, it, keeps, uh, it, it transfers to them. It takes it away, right? Just, uh, divest. Divest. That, that's, that's the technical term. It divests. So the executory interest is interesting. It screws someone. It takes away someone else's property. And it's either going to take away the property of the grantor or the grantee. It's going to screw either one of them. Because remember, we have these future interests, right? The future interest can be the transferor, or the future interest can be the transferee. The executory interest takes, or, or divests, Jameson used the right word, it divests from the transferor or the transferee. That's what it does. It, it takes the property from someone else when there's a certain condition that's satisfied. Okay? So we're going to do some new terminology now. Um, Zach, what do you call it if the transferee's interest is divested? What's that called? Exactly right. So we got some new vocabulary. I mentioned this in the last class, and I didn't want to focus on it too much because we weren't ready for it yet, but we'll, we'll hit it here. So we have a shifting executor interest, and like Zach said, that divests the interest of the transferee. So if it's from A to B, so long as, you know, from A to B until condition satisfied, then to C, if that condition happens, B's interest is cut short. And that's called a shifting executory interest. Okay? So, uh, uh, Daniel, what's the other one? What's the one that divests the interest of the transferor? Okay. Exactly right. Springing executory interest. And that does just that. It divests the transferor. Um, the, you're probably going to get, try not to get these confused. I mean, one way I, re I can remember this, and it works for me, is that the, uh, the transferor gives, and like a spring gives water. Um, that works for me. You can make up your own device, but the transfer, you know, gives something, and, you know, a spring, you know, springs forth water. Try whatever you remember if you find some other mnemonic device, um, but just make sure that you know whether something's shifting, or there's something springing. Okay. All right, everyone with me so far? All right. Uh, there's a problem in the book. I forgot what page is on. One second. No, 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 no. Here it is. Uh, here we go. One second. Let me bring up. I don't remember what page it's on. Um, yeah, no, that's not it. Okay, uh, I'll get to that one later. Okay, no, I'll skip that one. Okay, so let's go ahead to explain a little bit of history. You know, okay, let's let's do example nine then. That that's that's a good um, that's a good example. Let's do example nine. So you all know what the statute of uses is. I'll talk about it in detail in a minute, but let's talk about things were before then. 
Um, so, um, Myra, take a second to le read example nine, please. I'm calling you in a bit. <laughs> okay. So the so the, so the question says. So before the statute of uses, so we're back in we're back in the 1530s. Okay. O conveys White Acre to my eldest son, A, and his heirs. But if A inherits Black Acre, then White Acre is to go to my second son, B, and his heirs. So I mean, we know what's going on here. He wants to make sure that his son A has has property. But if his son A gets a different piece of property that's Black Acre, then he should go to his other son. So his other son's not with that. Obviously, maybe A is a firstborn son, you know, primogenitor. He wants a firstborn son to get something. So explain why it is that B takes nothing. And remember, before 1536. Why is it that B takes nothing here? But what about the father's grant? Didn't the father give a remainder to, I'm um, sorry, an executor interest to, to A? I don't think he can because it's a piece of No, no, no. But before 1536, it says, to my eldest son A and his heirs. That's fee simple, right? But there's more to the grant. The grant says, but, blah, 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 it goes to my second son B. Why does that second son B not divest as an executory interest? Why is there not a, uh, a, a, a shifting executory interest there? Uh, because the, the grantor can't, um, can't divest his own property. That couldn't be part of The answer is historical. I, you're, you're on the right track, but the answer is historical. Originally, at common law, you could not create this right of entry in the stranger. Way back when in common law, you couldn't do executory interests. The common law judges didn't like this. They thought it was a bad idea. They didn't like the idea that you're giving your dear old son A this piece of land, and then some event happens in the future, that land disappears. It gets cut away from his knees. Okay. Now, we did love conditions before. It says, so long as you use this land for a park, you get to keep it. That's a lot more fair. And the reason why is because the person who's using it as a park is the person living on it. It's within his control. He can decide whether he follows that condition. Here, there's something entirely independent. Whether he inherits Black Acre or white, Black Acre is beyond his control, unless like, he kills someone, I don't know. But he can't control if he inherits it. So the courts don't like conditioning stuff on something out of your control because it's not fair. Okay? So at common law, you couldn't have these kinds of interests. So... Uh, Look at example 10, uh, uh, Heather. Uh, so prior to the statute of uses, O conveys to A and her heirs when A marries B. A, why does A take nothing? Right, this is similar. Remember we did gifts, right? The components of a gift are present intent to give. Remember we did the case of the painting. He did not intend to give the land at this point. He only intended to give it in the future when the girl gets married. It lacked the present intent. So it was an invalid gift. Okay? So this was the historical um, this was the historical way of doing things. You could not do these kind of roundabout ways of transferring property. But lawyers who've been doing this stuff for for millennia, came up with this idea of the use. Um, and I don't like using the word no, use because it's confusing. It doesn't, it doesn't mean what you think it means. So whenever you see the word use, think of for the benefit of. Just whenever you see the word use, just like substitute for the benefit of. The use has a lot of similarities to what we would call a trust today where you're not giving a person a piece of property to keep for themselves, you're giving it to a trustee for the benefit of someone else. They can hold it, they can do stuff with it. So remember we talked about Paris Hilton, 
she's a trust she's a you know a trust a, a trustee baby well what she actually is is someone was given a piece of property fee simple for the benefit of Paris Hilton that's how parents can make sure that their kids don't become spendthrift so this this, this concept of the use develop to try and get around these rules where at common law you couldn't put an interest in a third party directly. So they did this kind of roundabout way, which was called the use. So let's take a look at example 11, please. Um, uh, Josh, in a second, take a look at example 11. It's on the next page, or in the bottom of that page. So it says, O goes in the land and it in fiefs. Um, that just means gives. You see, like, enfiofs, whatever, gives. Just say gives. So he in fiefs X and his heirs to hold to the use of A and his heirs. So uh, the way I want you to read that sentence is X and his heirs to hold for the benefit of A and his heirs. For the benefit of, okay? So when you see the use of just in your head put the benefit of. So X and his heirs to hold for the benefit of A and his heirs. But if A inherits the family manor, then to the benefit of O's second son B and his heirs. So explain to me, just in your own words, what's what's going on here? What what what's probably happening here? Basically, yeah, A and B are probably minors. That's probably what's going on here. A and B are kids; they're minors. They can't take care of the property themselves. So O gives it to his friend X, saying, "Listen, I'm going to give it to you to hold for their benefit." I mean, it says. To, to X and his heirs, that's fee simple, right? But it's limited because it's to the use of or for the benefit of A and his heirs. So the fee simple grant is specifically tied to the benefit. So he gets X and his heirs to holding the use of A and his heirs. But if whatever reason A inherits the manor, then X will then hold it for the benefit of the second child, B. Okay? This was a way of getting around the ban and executory limitations. I mean, the phrase executory interest did not exist then. We, we use this phrase today, but giving something to a third party to hold, that's how we get around this. Okay? So there was a split of authorities, and I've mentioned this point before, but by the 1500s, there was, a, there was two different kinds of courts in England. There were the courts of law and the courts of equity, also called courts of, courts of chancery or courts of equity. They're called, they're called both things. The courts of law, these are the common law courts, and they said... Uh, no, this is not valid. X can't serve as a trustee. So when the common law courts looked at this grant, they said, no, 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 no. Like the Kempe Matambo, no, no, no. This is a fee simple absolute. That's all it is. Fee simple absolute for X. They would not recognize that. But the courts of equity, the courts of chancery, they took a different approach. They said, well, you know what? X has the duty to hold this for the benefit of A. And if there's some other event that occurs, this thing called a shifting event, where A inherits the manor, then X now is due to hold it for B. The way the, the, the equitable court said is there's no divesting of property because X was never given it straight up in the first place. He's only given it for the benefit of someone else. So there's no big deal if he's giving it to the benefit of A or giving it to the benefit of B. The shifting event, the inheritance of the manor, triggers it. Okay. But there's a problem with this one, as far as the king's concerned. Uh, back there, Brandon. In, remember we talked about the delivery of Sison, right? Remember the, the transfer of the clump of dirt? Remember you watched that video a couple weeks ago? Do you think delivery of Sison needs to happen when the shifting event happens, when it goes from A to B? It no, it doesn't. The way taxing works, they were called feudal incidents, right? You were taxed at Sizen. So when you dumped that clump of dirt, the king got a cut. Why do you think the lawyers were so keen about this way of transferring property? Yes. Lawyers from time immemorial have been avoiding taxes. It's what we do very well. So the beauty of this, of this use was you didn't have to clump the dirt. You didn't have to do the Sizen. And because the laws are written to say that you only paid upon Sizen, the king didn't get a cut. And if history teaches us anything, it's that government does not like being cut out of the tax loop. 
Um, they're not, they don't like it. And usually when, when lawyers find a creative way of doing this, they try to close it. Okay? So uh, we have now a uh, mini history lesson for you uh, all. Because you all love history. Who, who knows who this guy is? This rotund fellow. Yes, sir. Oh. No, what, what number? Eight. Okay, so who here knows who Henry VIII is? Who you, why is he famous? It's not the Statue of Uses. Wise. Wise? Okay, what else? What's yeah. he most famous for? Do you know why? Because he couldn't get one or, or maybe more of his marriages in <laughs> Okay. So Henry VIII is a very curious figure. I guess it's, it's, it's timely now that we're talking about the, uh, the replacement of the Pope. Um, but, but Henry VIII became the king, and he was very, very uh, petulant, if you will. Um, he, was, he was obsessed with finding a male heir, with creating a male heir. Um, as we all know genetically, you know, the, the female deposits the X chromosome, and the father can deposit either the X or the Y chromosome, right? If the father deposits an X, it's a girl. If the father deposits a Y, it's a, it's a boy. So it's a father's fault if there's no boy offspring. It's a man's fault. They didn't know back then. They blamed the woman. So Henry VIII married, and this is, you know, he's a, he's a strapping fellow, very, very rotund with that, that beard. Uh, he married, he had six total wives, okay? So first he married Catherine of Aragon. Uh, he was married to her for almost 25 years. She did not produce him a son. Uh, she produced him a, a girl, or I think maybe a couple girls, but a girl. He became incensed, and he wanted to get a divorce. Back in the day, how do you get a divorce? Unless, or, who are you going to call? The Pope. It, it's, difficult, it's difficult to fathom how much control the Pope had over Europe. It, it's, it, you can't really explain it, but every, every country in, Cat, in Europe was a Catholic nation, and the Pope had supremacy. Um, in fact, the, the, the current Pope is, is stepping down on Thursday. Um, the last pope to voluntarily step down, I think, was in the 1500s, the 1400s. It's been a while. 1400s. Was it? Does it? Yeah, so it's been, it's been like five centuries or something. So <laughs> the consequences of a pope stepping down today and then are different deals. I think when, he, when the pope stepped down 500 years ago, there was a lot of political turmoil. And anyway, so, oh, do you know what the pope's title will be after he steps down? Pope Emeritus. That will be his title. And he will, he will wear white, but he will not wear the moccasins. He'll have his other shoes. So. He wanted to get divorced, and he asked the Pope, hey, Pope, can I get divorced? And the Pope said, no, too bad. Stick with her. I don't care. And there were a lot of uh, things. I think Catherine Aragon was from Spain, I think, and Spain was a big Spanish nation. Yes, sir? The big problem was the innocent brother's wife, and I think the Bible said it was his wife's wife. He believed that was why he could have a son. It, Aragon married his brother? Well, she was originally married to his older brother. Older brother died. Oh, okay. I didn't... Very good. I didn't know that. But Aragon's from Spain, right? I think. Okay. In any event, he wanted a divorce. Pope said no. So he's like, all right, you know what? Screw this. I don't need your permission. But back in the day, you couldn't tell the Pope no. If you told the Pope no, you would have a civil war, some sort of holy war in your hand, a crusade. I don't even know what you would call it. So he had a genius idea. I will make my own religion. I will call it the Church of England. And the king will be the head of this, of this faith. And at that point, England is fractured off from the Roman Catholic Church, and it formed the Church of England, or Anglicanism, or, or you can call it various things, uh, 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 things. But this was along with the Protestant Revolution around a you know, similar time. So they broke off. He's like, okay, you know what? Good to be the king. I'm getting, I'm getting a divorce, right? So he gets divorced. Perfect. So then he marries Anna Boylan, right? He's like, okay, got this. I got, I, got, I got a female kid coming up, no problem. I got a male heir. So he married her for a couple years, and female heir. One of them was Elizabeth, who became Queen Elizabeth I. And he didn't divorce her, though. Uh, he executed her. He actually beheaded her for giving him a female child. Uh, take, take two, or take three. He married Jane Seymour. Um, she was quite old at the time. I think she had like a number of male heirs. So it was like, you know, she's going to give me a male heir. And then she died after a year. All right, so take four. Uh, he tries with Anne of Cleves. And he was married to her for, I think, like six months. Yeah. Ridiculous. And he divorced her. Uh, you can see this guy is getting very, very uh, uh, unruly. And then Catherine Howard, again, she couldn't give him male heir, so he killed her. He executed her. 
And then finally, the last one, Catherine, he, she outlived him, so she couldn't get killed. So the rhyme, has anyone ever heard this? Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. That's how you remember the, the order. It's divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. So that's Henry VIII. The guy was a... <laughs> Uh, he's crazy. But he gave us something in property that's still with us today. The Statue of Uses. And all this is a roundabout way of getting to the fact that he changed the way executor interests work. So if you hate executor interests, blame this guy. Him. You can, you, can, you, can, you can show your ire to King Henry. Okay? All right, so back to... Back to... Then he married his brother's sister, which is an ex... Oh, thank you, Thomas. And speaking of Thomas More, if anyone saw Justice Scalia wearing the hat on the inauguration, it was actually a copy of the hat Sir Thomas More wore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead. So, what was I up to? Okay, so, um, so Tyson, what, what did the Statue of Uses aim to do? And what, what was Henry's motivation in, in passing this law? Right, so what does that mean? Right, so, so basically what it did was it said, okay, you know what? If you want to leave land to a third party, that's fine. You can do that, but I'm going to tax it. In other words, the moment when the third party gets a property, you're going to pay me. You don't have to do the liberal size for me to get paid. That, that's it. Um, the word ex executive, uh, executed, which is what James had mentioned before, means to, to, to make into action or to complete or something like that. So it just executed it right away. You didn't have to go through the formalities of dumping the clump of dirt. And, and this is where the terms of shifting and springing came in. There was a shifting event, I'm sorry, a shifting use, which then became the shifting executory interest, and the springing use, which became the springing executory interest. Okay? So there are a number of problems which I think illustrate this much better than I could ever even try to explain, so we'll, we'll do those. Uh, yeah, there's King Henry, uh, mean guy. Okay, so um, Nancy, let's take take a look at example twelve, please, and take a second to read it. I'll call on you. Okay, so we are after fifteen thirty six. We are after King Henry is split off, made his own religion, changed property law. He kept himself pretty busy. Killed a wife or two. So it says, after 1536, O bargains and sells to A and his heirs. Okay, so let's just stop there. To A and his heirs, what is that, Nancy? Just stop at the comma, to A, to A and his heirs. What, what would we call that grant if that's where the sentence ended? Yeah, that, that's pretty simple. Okay, we keep reading. But if B returns from Rome, then to B and his heirs. Okay. Louder, please. Okay, but now we're getting confused. I'm asking, you're giving, possibly reverter, right? Let's go back to our list. Possibility of reverter refers to the interest in the transfer war, right? We are looking at the, at the transferee, which, which in this case is kind of be, not really, but we'll cl close enough to be transferee. So we're talking about executory interest, okay? So let me go back to the question. So just be very careful, yeah, don't tell me possibly reverter when we're talking about the executory interest, okay? So what kind of executory interest would this be, Nancy? Why is it shifting? It's louder, I can't hear you. Who's getting divested? Who's getting screwed here? A is getting screwed. A is the transferee, right? O is a transferor. A is a transferee. And B is executory interest. If B gets back from Rome, B comes home, he's going to then take the land from A. B is divesting A of his land. 
We would not say B as a remainder because he's not the transferee. He's the executor of interest. Okay? Because he's not involved in the original transaction. He only comes in the picture if he does something. These are almost always done where the reason why the land gets back is out of the control of the transferee. If the transferee A has no way of controlling this. Usually with, you know, uh, uh, various remainders, it's, you know, as long as you use this as a school or something like that. That's in your power. But almost always in these cases, it's something else happens outside of your power. Okay? So let's look at example 13. Um, uh, uh, Courtney? I'm sorry, Leslie. So say, just read uh, 13, I'll call you in a second. So it says, after 1536, so we have statute of uses, O covenants to stand seize, which basically means to give, for the benefit of A and her heirs when A marries B. What interest, or let, let me first like this. When I say O covenants to stand seized, what that means is that O gets the land from Harley. I like this better. So imagine that you're, you know, you're a father, right? And you have a piece of land. And you are nagging on your daughter to get married. You want her to get married. Say, hey, listen, I'm going to hold on to this land until you get married. So even though I already have fee simple, I'm going to limit my own interest. I'm going to say, I will keep this land fee simple for your benefit. And when you get married, you get to keep it outright. What, what's the executor interest here? Why? Yes. O is a transferor. This is a spring interest because it divests his own interest. You might say, why would anyone ever want to divest his own interest in land? Well, this. This is an example. A conditional wedding gift. You know, you get married and you get to keep it yourself. I will gladly give it up because I want to make sure my daughter gets married. Okay? Everyone okay with this? Okay. So today these are what we have called fee simple subject to an executory limitation. Um, and, and the terminology is, is mostly the same. So let's go on to um, 14. Uh, Jesse, please. Example 14. I think it's at the bottom of that page. Take a second to read it. So it says, O conveys to A and his heirs. So again, that, that's a fee simple grant if we, if we stop there. But if A dies without surviving him, to B and her heirs. What's A's interest here? How would we describe A's interest? Okay. With what limitations? Good. A's interest is effectively fee simple, but there's a limitation on it. The executor limitation is if, if he dies before a B. I'm sorry, uh, if A dies before a O. Okay? Who di uh, so, uh, let Jesse, who divests A's interest? Who, who cuts it away? Good. So would this be shifting or springing? Is A the transferor or the transferee? Why? Out loud, I can't hear you. What is he? Transferee, you said? That's right. A is a transferee. His interest is getting divested, so it's getting cut out, and that means it's a shifting executor interest. Okay, everyone get that? All right, uh, Courtney, take a look at number 15 the bottom of the page on top of the next one. Okay, so it says, O conveys to A for life, so a life estate. Okay. Then to B and her heirs, 
But if B dies under the age of 21, to C and her heirs. We know that B is 15. So let's go through the estates. What estate does A have? Okay, good. What about B? What kind of remainder? And you have to explain why to it. I know it's up there. It's vested. Why is it vested? No, no, no. Why is the remainder vested? What makes a vested remainder? Good. What's the other one? Right. So, ascertain B. He's a person. We know he is. And there's no condition precedent. Death is not a condition precedent. It's not. You'll see this over and over again. Death is not. Everyone dies. Okay? So that's that. Uh, and it's not contingent. Now, Courtney, what interest does C have? What kind? Be precise. Yes, exactly. C has a shifting executory interest because divest the transferee's interest. Okay? And it doesn't vest or become possessory until the condition happens. So I think there's another couple. There's actually good examples in this chapter. I like them. All right, so let's take a look at 16. Um, yes, sir. Ju yes, Justin, you have a question? No, I'm just angry. I was going to go to him, but you're up next. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So I always snake around. It's, uh, it's, it's random. So 16. So it says... Um, O conveys to the school board, but if the premises are not used for school purposes, then to the library. Okay? So, what is the interest the school has here? Okay. But what conditions are attached to it? Right. And this is an automatic divesting. It doesn't, nothing has to happen. And, and then we would say that, is a library's interest shifting or springing? Why? Yeah. So this is the same deal over and over again. Everyone kind of getting, getting the swing of this? You have to ask the questions. Who's getting screwed? Is it the transferee or the transferor? Okay, I think there's one more of these examples, and we'll go into the other problems, okay? Um, all right, so, uh, William, take a look at 17, and, and let me uh, take a second to read it. Okay, so it says, O conveys to the school so long as the premises are used for school purposes, then to town library. What estate does the school have? Well, what estate do they have? It's a little review. What are the words used? Yeah, what does that tell us? No, not life estate. What you say it is that? Do you, okay, so this is going back three classes, okay? Well, well, okay. When it says so long as, remember what that triggers is the duration, right? So remember the, three, the different kinds of states. There's fee simple, there's fee simple determinable, and fee simple subject to condition subsequent. Remember that chart we made? If you look back on the chart, if you see the word so long as, it tells you what a state it is. Uh, Armando, what kind of state is it when it says so long as, if you look at that chart? Uh, the, uh, the other one. Determinable? Yeah. So long as, while, during, we see these words, it's a fee simple determinable. I told you, memorize the chart or at least have it at your hand because you, you have to just have it. Because when you have a sentence like this, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's estates, there's future interest in the transferor, there's future interest in the transferee, there's executory interest, there's a lot of moving parts, and you need to be able to break everything down one at a time. So this says, to the Harper School Board, so long as. So we know that the school board has a fee simple determinable. But it's a fee simple determinable subject to an executory limitation. Okay?
And who has executory interest? Um, uh, Elizabeth? Uh, the town library. And what kind of interest would it be? A shipping. Right, because it's divesting. So in this one question, there's a couple things you can find. The Hartford School Board gets the fee. There's a the estate being transferred is a fee simple determinable. Okay, then the library has the shifting executory interest. Just from those, you know, nine or ten words, you can learn a lot about what's going on. So just go back, look at that chart over and over again, memorize it over your life. Yes, sir. Which ones? Uh, what was 16 say? I already forgot. Uh, oh, but if. So the difference is actually the words. I can scroll this. So it says, this is to the school board, but if the premises are not used. And here it says, so long as. Uh, I'll ask you, what, what does the word but if suggest? What kind of, what kind of a state is that? So that means it's going to automatically go. It's not going to, they don't have, there's no right of entry. There's a, a possibility of burden. What? Okay. Uh, so, not quite, but we'll go over that now. It's a good point. So, David, we just said here when O conveys to Hartford School Board so long as. That's a, 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 a fee simple, defeasible, right? What is the future interest associated with the fee simple, defeasible, or terminable? Uh, the possibility of reverter. That's the one that's automatic. But does O retain that possibility of reverter? David? Yeah. Is there any reversion to O? No. No. O has given up his, his possibility of reverter. He's given that possibility of reverter to the library. And when it's given to the library, it's no longer called a possibly reverter. It's now called an executory interest. You got that? So go up here. Um, I'll, uh, so, so in this one, it says, O conveys to the school board, but if the premises are not used. So what kind of a state is this one says, but if? The state, I'm asking. No, no, the other one. Fee simple subject condition subsequent, yeah. right? We see but if it's a fee simple subject condition subsequent. That's usually associated with what future interest in the transfer were. But does O retain the right of entry here? He gives it away, and who gets it? And was library What's it called then? Exactly. Beautiful. Everyone just understand what we just talked about. You got to memorize these terms. There's no other way. If you don't, if unless you see the words but if and think, oh yeah. Uh, fee simple, subject condition subsequent, right of entry. Unless that triggers in your mind, you're going you're gonna to get blown away with this because it's not, it doesn't make sense otherwise. So memorize that stuff. Just remember what those words are. We're going to have a lot more problems today. We've got another uh, 40 minutes worth, so I will do this in, in as much detail as you need. Yes, ma'am. So for example 16, you're giving up the right of entry to the town library, which means that the town library has to pursue an action. <laughs> Automatically? Yes. It, there's still this condition subsequent. It doesn't vest automatically. That's right. Yes, sir. Under example 16, it says that, that it will automatically divest. If the condition happens. Right. And part of that condition is taking the steps. Yeah. The, the, the idea is, so just read this. Right? And just, just, just linguistically. Like, don't even worry about law. This says, to the school board, so long as it's used for our school versus then to the town library. Okay? The comma means then to the town library means automatically. This one, uh, there's a but if, it, it suggests that something else has to happen first. And the, the something else happens is part of that contingency. So it, it's it's... It automatically divests. It says, okay. Uh, okay. It automatically divests in the sense that when the condition happens, we still have to take steps for it to happen. In other words, the executor interest still have to go to court and then kind of sue for it. 
Okay. Isn't that not, isn't that, isn't automatic saying that you don't have to go to court, it's yours now? And not automatic is that you do have to go to court and get it? One second. Uh, let me get back to that exact point because I, what you're saying makes sense, but I have something in my notes which is something slightly different, and there might be a wrinkle that I'm not remembering. So let me get back to that one, okay? Um, what well, you're saying makes sense, but just there's something in my notes and I don't remember which is the right way, so I don't want to tell you the wrong thing, okay? I apologize for that. I will, I will check that later. Okay. So everyone minus that one thing. Everyone okay? Everyone okay with this? All right. Let's, uh, let's do a number of uh, uh, problems. So this is... Uh, okay. All right. So where else I have to? Okay. So take a look at question one, please. Okay, so all of these questions begin with like, like this. So it says, um, owns Black Acre. He wants to give a Black Acre to his son for life, and then on the son's death, to the son's children if they're alive, and if not alive, to owe to the daughter. So what this is saying is, listen, I really like my son and his family, and I don't like my daughter so much. But if everyone else in my son's side of the family dies, the daughter gets it. Okay? So this is the instrument that, that that's done. It says... O conveys to A for life, then to A's children and their heirs. But if the time of A's death he has not survived any children, then to B and her heirs. Okay? So it's in time to convey A is alive and has no children. Okay, let, let's break this down. So, Khaled, what, what estate does A have? No, A. Read the first three or four words. What kind of estate is that? Oh, life. Yeah, life estate. Nothing tricky there, okay? Uh, down front, uh, Alicia. Oh, I'm sorry, Leah, sorry. What estate does A's children have? Um, just a key symbol. No. A, A is still alive. Oh, so they have, um, so they have key symbol. Oh, wait, no, no, no. They have um, future interests. So that would be they would have a vested right there. Why is it vested? Because uh, the persons are ascertained. Okay. Um, and it's not subject to any conditions. It's just. Well, but the interesting part is it might not be that way. Because what happens if A has children that are alive today, right? And both those children die. And then at the time of A's death, there are no children. B gets it. So although this says to A's children and their heirs, the heirs of A will only get it if the children outlive the dad. Everyone see that? It's, it's a contingent remainder because there's a condition precedent. Remember we said with a contingent remainder, that's the, the, if there's a condition precedent, the condition precedent is the children have to outlive their parent. In this question, what happens if the parent outlives the children? The children's heirs are out of luck. So it's actually a contingent remainder. Everyone see that? What about subject, like vested remainder subject to open because it's not a it's born child yet? It, it would probably be subject to open as well, but the key part is there's a condition precedent. And that makes it a contingent remainder. And if it's a contingent remainder, you don't have to talk about the open so much because it's still up in the air. You only have to talk about the subject of the open once vested. The key thing, if the children don't survive the parents, the children get nothing. And the children's heirs get nothing. So it's not a vested remainder. There's a condition precedent there. Tricky, right? So, Sarah, what interest do B's children have? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, take a, take a guess. We only have a, what interests do you think these kids have? Think about it. The executory interest. Um, the it's non executory interest. Okay. Why is it non executory interest? Are B's kids ever actually taking it away from A's kids? No. If they never get in the first place. A's kids only get it upon A's death. So there's no shifting being done because you're never screwing over A's kids. So what kind of interest then do B's B have? These kids have. So if it's not if it's not executor interest, what other kind of future interest could it be? Well, let me ask this: Is B a transferee or an executory interest? How would you how would you describe B's kids? No, you, you're absolutely right. They're the transferee. Okay. So if they're the transferee. What kind of interest do they have? Yeah. Take like a while. B's kids have a contingent remainder. I know it, it, it tortures your brain. B, B's kids have a contingent remainder. They will only get it if a certain condition precedent satisfied. That is, A's kids die before A. If that happens, then B's kids get it in fee simple. Hmm. Painful, right? A's kids have contingent remainder. They both have contingent remainders. Because if you look at this grant, they're both transferees. They're both transferees. And they both have contingent remainders. It's painful, I know. So, all right, Heather. I'm sorry, Heather. So let's take a look at the next paragraph, right? So it says, two years later, they're twins, C and D, and they're born to A. OK? So A has these two kids. Okay. What estate does A have? That's the easy one. Okay. Now, what about C and D? Remember, in this previous question, A has no children. So it was unclear. These people were not ascertained. Right? Here, what estate do the C and D have, the kids? Do they still have a contingent remainder because they still have to outlive A? But they're born. They're ascertained, though. In the previous one, there were no children. I think I forgot to mention that. And I, I may have tortured Sarah necessarily. In the previous one, there were no children. So they were not ascertained. So here, now that they're ascertained, we would call it, what, what he said, the, the vested uh, remainder subject to open. Because there could be more children born, or whatever. But there's a class. And the law treats these as a vested remainder subject to open. So, uh, Willis, you're, you're one question at this, of, the, of the, the step. OK? So A's kids have a vested remainder subject to open. OK? But now, we've got a different situation with B's kids. What does B's kids have here? It's a different situation because we've ascertained kids. Oh, Reese, sorry. Yeah. Um, Here, there was nothing to be taken away because A didn't have any children. No one's interest is being cut away. Okay? But here, there are children in existence. Will, in order for B to take, would you have to cut away any interest from A and B? I'm mean, sorry, C and D? Yeah. So, what do we call that? Executory. Good. Uh, and what kind? You're on the right. You're, you're right there. Yeah. It'd be shifting. Exactly. Everyone see that? B's kids, their interest is a shifting executory interest. Why? Because they'd be cutting away the interest of C and D. C and D have this vested remainder subject to open. It's vested. 
And when you're cutting away a vested remainder, it's executory interest. Remember, like last week, I said there were different pairings, right? Remember, I said whenever there's a vested remainder, it's probably going to be followed by a, an executory interest that's shifting. I think that's in the notes from last week. That's this. Because if there's something vested, if someone has it for sure, and someone's taking it away, that's an executory interest. If it's contingent, it's followed by another contingent. These two paragraphs are those pairings I mentioned at the end of last class. If you go back to your notes, you'll see those. But that, that's this. Okay? All right. So, Will, let's take a look at the final um, iteration, this, this one here. So it says, C dies. You know what? Let's get that one. Unimportant. Too many other things to do. Okay? So instead, take a look at um, a letter B, please, okay? So it says, O conveys to A for life, then to such of A's children as survive him, but if none of A's children survive him, to B and their heirs. Okay? So at the time, A is alive, and has two children, C and D. So when the question is, what's the state of the title, what I'm asking you to do is go through each person. So I'm going to ask you, uh, A has a life estate. That, that's easy enough. What about C and D? Um, they have a contingent remainder. Why? Because it's it's not for sure that um, well A is not dead yet basically right. Well, the death. Or they they haven't li outlived A yet. The, A hasn't that that's probably true, but the better answer is it's not all the children haven't ascertained yet. Okay. That that that's the better reason why it's contingent remainder. Okay. The, 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 the better reason, and, and you're, you're on the right track, but the better reason here is that not all the children are ascertained. So it said to A for life, then to such of A's children who survives him. It's possible A might have more children, so it's not vested. Yes, sir. So, so, don't, so subject to open only applies to vested remainders. If it's contingent, you don't need the subject to open because it's already up in the air. It means it's contingent. Right, but this is second. Uh, um, where is it? It says in the book. Which which page are you looking at? Well, the, but the issue is not, that's the only thing I described this, but the issue is for C and D, the, um, their remainder, I'll put it this way, it says to such of A's children, which could be an open class, right? So I think the reason why it's a contingent fee simple is, is a combination of the fact that not all of them has been ascertained because it could be a vested open, but it's also you have this condition because they have to survive the father. So I, the, and I'm, I'm, this is a tricky stuff to, comp, to express. I'm trying my best, um, and I apologize. I'm not as sharp as I usually try to be. But you, your first inclination was right. There was this um, condition precedent, the fact that they have to out-survive him. And that combined, I think, with the fact that not all of them have been ascertained makes this a... Uh, uh, can you remainder? Um, the distinctions between these are often somewhat fuzzy and nebulous. Um, and, and I fully appreciate the difficulty of doing this. So, and just so you know, at the exam, there's probably going to be something which can maybe reasonably read either way. It's inevitable. And I'll probably will do something like that on purpose. So I want to try and see how you think these through. So if what you just said, the fact that if there's one child in the class, and it's been ascertained that's a, that's a vestry major subject open, that's a very reasonable answer. And what you said is because of the fact that there's this condition precedent that they have to survive the father, I think that's also a reasonable answer. So 
I think both of you are probably right. What I have in my notes, which I think is probably the better the answer is a contingent remainder, but I think your answer is probably right on track as well. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So, assuming this is a contingent remainder, right? Let's just, we'll assume just for sake of, of this discussion. Contingent remainder. Remember we did those pairings before. When you have two stacked future remainders, a contingent remainder, what comes after it? I think Kira, you're up next. When you have two stack, we have one contingent remainder, what comes after it? Good. Why is it not an executory interest? <laughs> why can't, why can't it be an executory interest? What's, 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 the difference between a contingent and vested remainder? Like what, what's actually, not the ascertained part, but what actually matters, what's the difference between the two of them? Good, right, so what happens is, if the second grant is, I'm sorry, if the first grant's only a contingent remainder, and the second one takes it away, the first grant never really had it in the first place. The crux of a condition, I'm sorry, the, the crux of a vested versus a uh, contingent remainder is a vested remainder, he's going to have it pretty much no matter what. There's no condition precedent. With a contingent remainder, he might have it or he might not have it. So if you're taking something from someone with a, condition, uh, a contingent remainder, then they never had it in the first place. So it's an executory interest. <coughs> okay? I, I, that was not the best explanation. But generally speaking, if the first one's a contingent remainder, I'm sorry, the, vers the first one's vested, it's followed by a contingent. If the first one's contingent, it's followed by another contingent. Uh, if I can write out like this. Whoa. <laughs> All right, someone went to Sunday school. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll look those later. So if they're consecutive grants, right? If the first one is a vested remainder, more likely than not, it'll be followed by an executory interest. If the first one is a contingent remainder, it'll be followed by a, another contingent remainder. And I can explain it like this. With a vested remainder, it's, it's, it's basically certain to happen. Um, it's a rare exception, it's certain to happen. In order for someone else to get it, that's has to be an executory move. That's be, you know, someone taking it away. With the contingent remainder, it's not certain that the first person will have it, so the second person doesn't need to take it away from him. Okay? Do those pairings make a little bit more sense now? What, what might be helpful for you is on an exam or somewhere else. If you can figure out what the first interest is, and you're not really sure about the second one is, try to maybe use this default rule, because more likely than not, you're going to be right. So, and to go back to the question that Joanna was mentioning before, if you pick the first one as a vested remainder, then you should probably follow through and know the second one will be an executory interest. That's where it matters. I'm not, I'm not going to beat you up if you mistake an executive uh, vested versus a contingent remainder. That, those are often subject to debate. But the nature of how these work really follows the, what happens afterwards. So will there be an executory interest or will another contingent remainder? And if it's going to be an executory interest, you'll tell me is it shifting or springing? And the question we just did, it's shifting. Okay. All right, how, how are we doing? Tutors. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, let's take a look at example C. So one right here. Um, uh, Candace, you're up in a second, okay? Okay, so it says O conveys to A for life, then to B and her heirs, but if A survives at his death by any children, then to such children, surviving children and their heirs. Okay? So we know A is a life estate, right? That, that's the easy one. What's B's interest? Um. 
Okay, let, let's do like this. So sometimes it might be easier to start the back end. So C and D are the children, right? What interest does C and D have? Okay. All right, so let's, Stephanie, what, what do you think the first interest is? That might help you. What do you think that, um, what interest do you think B has? It's going to be a remainder. We know that much. So what kind of remainder is it going to be? It's going to be a decimal. That's correct. Why? Because it's given to a massive university. Good. That's right. So B's remainder is vested. But what limitations on it? And Candace, this might, this might help you out. What limitation is on B's vested remainder? Children. Good. And what do we call that? What ha what happens to B if that condition is satisfied? Does B gain it or lose it? I mean, it's like... Good. So we say that B has a vested remainder subject to divestment. So Candace, now that we know that B has a vested remainder, what do we call the interest then of C and D? Good. Why? Go back to the pairing right here. If we know the first one's a vested, more likely than not, we know that the second one's executory. But why is that the case intuitively? What is it about a vested remainder that, that lends itself well to an executory interest? No. Thomas, what do you think? Why is it an executory interest? Why, why is the second one executory? Good. And what, what's happening? What, 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 are, what are C and D doing? Yes. Yes. With a vested remainder, it's vested. That means it's certain. But C and D are going to take it away from him. So we say that... Uh, you know, B has a vested remainder subject to divestment, and C and D have an executory interest. And what kind of executory interest is it? There are only two kinds. Shifting and springing. Oh, they're they're springing. Shifting. Which one? Shifting. Why? Because B will get it, not the not. The transfer, he gets it. Okay, so I think we walked through that one. That's correct. So A is a life estate. B is a vested remainder, subject to divestment. And then C and D have this executor interest that's shifting. How's everyone, everyone get that so far? Yes, sir. Ask lots of questions. We'll, we'll take our time. Vested remainder, subject to divestment? Yes. Wouldn't that be a contingent <laughs> remainder? <laughs> I know it, 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 it's, it's terrible. They're, 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 they're very close. You could make the case that it's also a contingent remainder. Um, the reason why this is probably better to be vested is that B is ascertained, and it's not really a contingent precedent. A vested remainder can be subject to divestment. Both vested and contingent remainders can be divested. Well, actually, no. If it's a contingent remainder, it won't be subject to divestment. The reason why is because it's contingent. It's not certain to happen. A vested remainder is usually certain to happen, but it can be divested. So let's just do a little, little linguistics here. So we have vested remainder, and we have contingent remainder. The very nature of the word contingent means up in the air. It's not certain to happen. So if there's an executive so if there's a contingent remainder, it'll be followed by another contingent remainder. Because the first one wasn't certain to happen. 
the vested remainder is vested. That is, it, it's you know sure to happen, or or, or very sure to happen. Not not one hundred percent, but sure to happen. The vested remainder, in order to be divested, must be paired with an executory interest. So you're never going to see a contingent remainder subject to a divestment because, by its very nature, it's contingent. Oh, uh, Someone found a flow chart. I, I haven't seen someone vouch for it, but um, oh, you can click on that link later. So the book has like this that table at the end. I didn't assign that page on purpose because it confused the hell out of me. I tried following it and I found it very unhelpful. Um, very often, people try and make the, the study guides and various tables to try and encapsulate very complex ideas into little things like this. Um, I, if, this if this is something that helps you, I mean, it might help you with a certain level, but um, as we've seen, there's a lot of fuzziness, and trying to go down this decision tree might not always be the best thing to do. Yes, sir? Uh, the I'm sorry, say that again, please. On the very last one, the last question you did. Okay. He has a vested remainder subject to divestment. Right. Can you also just say subject to shifting of interest? You could say that, yes. Yes. On like an exam? Yes, that's correct. That's more precise, yeah. Yes, you could say that. All right. So if. So then you would probably say uh, a vested <laughs> vested remainder subject to open subject to divestment. Is that better? Is that you, you can you can string the vet, the subject to is fifteen length long. So I was trying to keep it simple, but yes, because not all the children are born yet. It'll be a vested. Re oh, you want to be precise? Okay. <laughs> Vested remainder and fee simple subject to open subject to a shifting executory interest. Better? <laughs> I'm trying to ease you into it, but but if you want to be precise, that you would say the entire string of things. And that's what we're trying to have here. Okay? <laughs> it's horrible. Blame Henry VIII. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I have mutton musting is easier than this class. Uh, all right, other questions? We'll do a little bit more. How are we doing? Other other questions? The, yes, sir. That's right. Well, change is the wrong word. It goes into execution. Yeah. Well, the the contingency will be tied to the. Uh, the interest of the first one will be linked to the second one. Let's go back to that question with Rome. That, that's a good example. Um, I don't know what example that was. Uh, when the guy gets back from Rome. So, to A and his heirs, but if B returns to, uh, to Rome, then to B and his heirs, right? That's example 12. Uh... Uh, actually, that'd be, that's a bad example. But but generally speaking, the, the reason I like it is the part with if B returns from Rome, the condition can be made any which way. The condition doesn't have to attach to the first transferee. The condition can attach to the second transferee. You can put the condition wherever you want. So the condition of the first transferee can be pegged to something that someone else does. Okay. So your question was complicated. I think I made it more complicated. But the condition can be placed on either person. All right, how are we doing? Other questions? Let's try um, some review question at the end, and we'll, we'll take that to the end of the class. So those begin on page uh, uh, 1199. That's at, at the, I'm sorry, the answers are there. Don't turn to the answers. Two, two, two se 271. I'm sure you're all on those pages right away. Hopefully try doing them without looking at the answers first. Bring cash and ID. Yeah, I'll need that later.
I got cash last night. Okay. So um, let's do question. Let's start at the very beginning. Perfect place to start. Uh, uh, Kristen, you're up next. So question number one. Take a second to. Okay. Okay. So it says O conveys to A for life, then to C is heirs. A, B, C, and O are all alive, and C is not married and has two living children. What does A have? Okay. What does B have? Um, well, let's put it this way: Is B's does B have a future interest? What's B's future interest? Will he get it? On what on what conditions will, will B get the land? And is death a condition precedent? No. So actually what B has is a vested remainder for life. The reason why, and, and you can go back and look at the answers later. I'm not telling you anything that's not in the book. But the reason why is B is ascertained, and then the death of A before him is not a condition precedent, because death is not a condition precedent. So it's ascertained, condition precedent, vested. Okay. So now, Kristen, what about C's heirs? Um, C has a contingent. Why? Um, because. Why isn't it vested? They're children. Doesn't mean we don't know like how many children. What word is in there that tells you? Right? No. What, what what's the key word in that sentence? That makes it contingent. Oh. I highlighted it. When does someone have heirs? I thought you were, is this kind of the old thing where you can marry each other? No, that's, uh, I'm not sure about that one. You don't have heirs till you're dead. So heirs. So as long as the parent is alive, not Well, yeah, heirs cannot exist until. A person is dead, so so it's a contingent remainder. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at question number two, um, uh, Brittany. Okay. So it says, "O conveys to A on a first wedding anniversary. O is alive, and she's an old maid. O is also alive. What's O's interest?" No, no, O. Oh. Uh, hmm. This is the case you mentioned before. I'm the father, right? I own land fee simple. I'm going to say to my daughter, hey, listen, I'll give this to you on your first wedding anniversary. So stick around for a year, okay? Who gets to keep it until she has, has her first wedding? Yeah. In what manner? What's it, what kind of estate? Fee simple, but with what, what limitations? On what circumstances does a father lose the land? Right. So what do we call that? No, no, no. It's a fee simple subject to what? No, no, no. What? Let's pause then. What interest... Does A have? Um, Good. A springy executory interest. Why? Yes. yes. So, A, when she gets married and stays married for a year, she divests the grantor. She divests O. So, what we say is that O has a fee simple subject to an executory limitation. O is a fee simple subject to a springing executory interest, right? Look at it both ways. What's, what's the interest of A? She has a springing executory interest. What's O have? A fee simple subject to a springing, to, springing executory interest. We define O's estate in terms of what A can get out of it. Okay, everyone get that?
All right, let's just skip three. Let's go to four. Um, uh, Corey, take a look at number four, please. Oh, you you you're praying for three? <laughs> that wasn't intentional. It's actually a good idea. I might skip around. Okay, so let's take a look at four. All right, so the facts are the same as three. So O conveys to uh, A for ten years, then to such of A's children as the age of twenty-one. Okay. And, okay, so here we're going to assume that X attains the age of 21 and Y is under 21. And we're alive. Okay? What happens when X becomes 21? What, what, what's his interest? Um, is, uh, his interest? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, the interest vests with him. It's a it's what well, we say it's a vested remainder, but subject to open. Why is it subject to open? Because until what? It's the remainder is until it turns twenty one. No, no. We just said X turns twenty one, right? What interest does X have at that point? I said okay, so I, I said it already. So when X turns twenty one he has a remainder subject to open. Why is it subject to open? Um, until his yeah, until his brother turns 21 or for someone else. So we say that X is rem a vest remainder fee simple subject to open. Okay? Now, what interest does Y have? Uh, uh, Matt? What, what does Y do once he turns 21? What's he going to do to X's interest? He divests him up. Good. So what, what's Y's interest called? That would be, I guess, the shipping that Yeah. So Y will take it from his brother X. Okay? All right. Let's do one more, and I'll spare you for the day. Uh, Vince, let's see. We'll do... Uh, okay, let's just do number six, okay? And I'll let you go after that. So O conveys to A for life and then to A's children. Okay. A and O are alive, and A is one child X. Okay, so the easy one, A is a life estate, right? Yeah. What about X, the child? Um, does X have a... Uh, yeah, perfect. That's exactly right. It's vested because he's ascertained, and there's no condition precedent because death is not a condition precedent. And it's subject to open because A might have, I'm sorry, that uh, the father might have more kids. Okay? What about. Hmm. What about, say that the mother gets pregnant, A gets pregnant. Unborn child. What interest does the unborn child have in a common with extra interest? Which is fascinating. Mom's pregnant. What what interest does the child have? What happens when the child's born? When the child when the child's born, wouldn't he have then a shifting executory interest? Perfect. Because the unborn child will then take from the interest of, of X. All right. Uh, go back and look through all ten of these and check the answer keys and just try and do them yourself. This is a very tough uh, topic and these are they're very nebulous lines between the two. So I, uh, I hope you'll just take time and get this. All right, have a good day, everybody. Okay. So thank you for bringing that up. You, you you weren't wrong and he wasn't wrong. It's just these. There's often right. very subtle differences, and it's. I try my best to try to explain it because to say it's one or the other, you're, neither of you are wrong. So I. So you, I understand. So thank you, though. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so when the, the second child is born, does he completely digest? I thought, or does he share that property with the other child? Well, no, it's not a complete divestment. He just splits the share. Right. So, so, okay. so, yeah, but your interest is still divested. Right, by right. I get that. I was just yeah. wondering if he actually takes right. the. That's right. That's right. How you doing, okay. my friend? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I
Right. No, it can be anyone with child born, unborn, in the in the womb, wherever. Any child subject to open just means that there may be another child born to a mother. That's all it means. As long as the woman's a fertile octogenarian, she's eighty years old, she can see, she, as long as she's alive, she can still give birth. Yep. Yes, sir. Oh, you were first. Sir. So this is starting to remind me a lot of logic from undergrad, which is many moons ago. But are there more rules to be revealed? Okay. The Actually, well, so the difficulty of teaching this is I can't I can't give it to you all at once. Right. It's almost like you know, like martial arts thing. You have to kind of reveal it in stages. So I I'm trying to layer it as best as I can. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, there are probably more rules, but I'm not gonna tell you what they are yet. Do you want to read ahead, Joel? Yes, sir. Okay, I had a question on uh, the first one that we did on the yep. review problem. Is that uh, C had, I guess C's children or whatever had a uh, contingent remainder? I'm sorry, where? On um, the first one that we did. Okay. Uh, C's heirs had a contingent remainder. Is the contingency isn't is the fact that she actually has because you said it can't be. Hold on, let me. They don't have a. Best let me take out my notes. Okay. Let me. Because uh. Right. Okay, so that's question one. Yeah. You're asking about C's interest? C's heir's interest. C's right, yeah, C's heir's interest. Yeah, it's a contingent remainder. Why is it a contingent remainder if it's contingent upon C's death? Because I thought the death couldn't be a contingency. Why is that not a... Because heirs are not ascertained until someone dies. Right. Heirs are always, heirs are always going to be contingent because they're not ascertained. By definition, heir can't be ascertained okay. until there's death. That's by definition. Okay. So you know, if you take children, that'd be a different story because the children can be ascertained. But, but the phrase heir... heir Air, and that's why I mentioned like two weeks ago. Heirs only come about after death. Right, right. And that's what I was confused about. That's right. Because it was also I thought that death yeah. wasn't a contingency. So yep. that's why. I was, but it is if in regards to heirs. Uh, yep. Okay. Arling Dell stressed the difference between common law and modern law. Are we going to need to know it? Or yeah, she emailed about that. So, so basically, the answer is I'll tell you what jurisdiction you're in the exam. Awesome. And if I don't, just assume it's common law. Assume it's common law. If I don't say, I mean, usually I'll say if it's first restatement or third restatement if it matters. But in this class, most of the stuff, it doesn't really matter. Most everything's common law. So the presumption is it's common law, so say otherwise. And she said the common law was that you presume it the life estate if it doesn't say, unless it expressly states something else. Okay. That's what she said. That might be true. I don't think we did that, but that might be true. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I'll say what it is. Okay, thanks. I, I'll, I'll try to make it as clear as possible what law you're applying. And so you don't have to, like, apply both, I guess. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make it as clear as possible if we're applying common law. I mean, with, with all this stuff, assume the statute of uses is in effect. Mm -hmm. Like, assume 1536 has happened already. We'll, we'll assume that much. And, I mean, everything we've done the past three days, I don't think it's really mattered much just in terms of uh, common law or modern statement. I mean, future interest is all common law. Okay. I mean, there, there might be one area where, where they can be alienated. And I think might be the only thing where a common law rule on matter, where they can alienate interest. If you tell me under the common law you can't alienate its interest, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. You're up. Oh, I just wanted to remind so, you that yeah. this is weird. And I don't, I don't like those diagrams. Well, it seemed like it made it sound like they're both automatic. You know, they're both I think, simple. They're see, both I think I think you're right, but I didn't want to say for sure because I'm not positive. I, th I think you're right. But I'm not positive, and I'm going to go check up on that. Yeah, I'm not, for sure. But I, just, I think, I mean, intuitively, I, I know that's what it says, and, and they know this stuff better than I do, so I'm, I'm just I'm not, I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll try and dig some more on this. If I forget, please remind me, okay? Okay. Well, I'm reminding right now. Can you <laughs> actually know what? Send me an email. Can you send me an email about this? Yes. And, and I'll, I'll try to find the answer to that. If I can't find it by Thursday, I'll find it by okay. next week. I'll try to find I'll the answer. I'll email you. I appreciate that, because sure. you, you're, what you're I saying makes I sense. No, no. You know what you're saying this makes sense, weird. and then when you said something, I was like, I was like, oh wow, maybe he's right, and it just it didn't it, it didn't match with my notes. Okay. okay, for sure. Yes, sir. Supplement goes into the. Uh, it's a the supplement. Condition. I've never seen this book. Ah, oh, this is for our book. I I don't know if it's no for different a different book. book. Okay. But, um, it goes into like the condition precedent must be in a subsequent clause in the sentence. Right. Or, are we going to get into that eventually? If it's on the book, we're not going to do it. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I'd recommend if there's a supplement for this book, you use it, but to the extent you, I mean, you're free to use whatever you want, but if there's something that is on our book and you're studying with something we didn't cover, then I mean, it's good to know, but... Well, I wasn't sure if we were going to get into it later. I, I don't think that is in this book. Um, if we haven't covered it yet, I don't think it will be. Okay. 
Thank you. Take care. Have fun at the rodeo. Thanks. I appreciate it. How expensive are we talking? Like twelve dollars of turkey money. Wow. I got. I got money. I think I'm good.